Welcome to the third module in the first week on ad hoc and implementation based problems. So in this video, we'll be talking about a problem called numbers game. And this one is again a problem that featured in a Google Code Jam contest, uh, this time from way back in 2010. Uh, this was the last problem in round 1A that year. And usually round one is a contest that lasts for two and a half hours. And uh, this particular round had uh, three problems that the contestants had to solve in that time. So as you can probably tell from the name of the problem, it perhaps involves some sort of a game. And I should mention that games are a fairly popular and recurring theme uh, in contest programming. But usually solving these problems requires some background in combinatorial game theory. Uh, but fortunately, this problem is an exception and you can unravel the solution pretty much by making observations from first principles. Although it doesn't hurt to be familiar with a little bit of game theory. So if that's you, that's great. But if not, then um, hopefully Hopefully this exploration motivates you to explore game theory more because it's a really wonderful topic. Uh, it's not something that we will be covering much more in this course, but uh, certainly uh, I hope that you have a chance to investigate it more independently. So with all that said, let's get started. I will, as usual, begin by presenting the problem statement to you. But this time I will defer telling you about the actual task for some time because I just want to spend some of the initial time just getting the hang of what's going on in the game. So we will do a bunch of examples first, get a feel for what's happening. And then I will introduce you to the task that we actually have to perform. So you might have to wait for it a little bit. And uh, with all that said, let's get started. So this is going to be a two player game. Uh, the names of the players are Arya and Bran. And the situation is that they are given two positive integers A and B, which are written on a blackboard in front of them. And uh, it's a turn based game of starting with Arya. So uh, first Arya is going to make her move, then it's going to go to Bran and so on. There is no passing when it is your turn, you have to make a move. Okay. Now, what does a move constitute? What can you do when it is your turn? Well, you can do one of two things. You can either update A with A minus KB or you can update B with B minus KA where K is some positive integer. So in other words, you cannot leave the numbers the same as they were before. They have to strictly diminish. And uh, the question is, what do you want to achieve, right? This is what you can do in your turn, but what is it that you want to achieve? You might want to speculate about what would the goal of such a game be, just for fun, yeah? Uh, before I actually reveal it to you. For instance, uh, could it be that the first player uh, who makes one of these numbers, zero or negative, wins the game? Well, if that's all that you had to do to win, then notice that this is not going to be a very interesting game to play. If Arya is playing optimally, when it is her turn in the very first move, she's just going to subtract one copy of the larger number from the smaller one. And if the numbers are both the same, then it doesn't matter which one you subtract from which. Either way, you will end up with a number that is either zero or negative immediately. So this is a game that will only last for a very short time and uh, is perhaps not worth analyzing further. So what's the actual objective of this game? It is in fact the opposite. So the first person who makes one of these numbers zero or negative actually loses the game. And now the whole situation is a whole lot more interesting. It's not obvious at all who is going to win given a pair of numbers. So let's actually try to get a feel for this by going through some examples. So to begin with, let's say that the two numbers we have are 12 and 51. So the boxes around these numbers are color coded based on whose turn it is. So if the boxes are red, then it's Arya's turn. And if the boxes are green, then it's Bran's turn. So Arya, let's say she makes her first move by subtracting three copies of 12 from 51. That's going to leave her with 15. So now it's Bran's turn and notice that he doesn't have much of a choice here. So he can either subtract one or more copies of 15 from 12, but if he does that, then he immediately loses the game. And when he's subtracting uh, K copies of 12 from 15, if K is bigger than one, then he's again lost immediately. So the only valid thing that he can do to stay in the game is to subtract one copy of 12 from 15. So let's say he does that, then he's left with 12,3, which is what gets passed on to Arya. 
Now, please take a moment here to think about if Arya has a winning move at this stage. In particular, can she do something to ensure that in the next step, Bran is left with no choice but to make a move that causes him to lose the game? Notice that Arya has limited options here. She can either subtract 1, 2 or 3 copies of 3 from 12. If she subtracts any more, then she herself loses the game immediately. However, Arya does have three choices of valid moves that would still keep her in the game. And by now you have probably guessed that among these options, her optimal move is to subtract three copies of three from 12, because when she does this, she's left with a configuration three comma three, which is what she hands over to Bran. And now you can tell that poor Bran in this situation is completely stuck and any move that he makes will be a losing move. And he has, as a result, lost the game and Arya has won. Now, before we go on to discuss more examples and things like that, I'd like to introduce a very important concept, uh, which is the notion of a winning position. This is uh, actually a part of the problem statement, and it's going to be very important for us to understand the task that we have to perform later on. So uh, we're going to say that AB is a winning position if Arya can always win a game that starts with AB on the blackboard no matter what Bran does. So in other words, no matter how cleverly Bran plays his moves whenever it's his turn, Arya will always have a way to inch closer towards victory. Okay, that's when you say that AB is a winning position. So in more standard game theoretic terminology, you would say that Arya has a winning strategy. A winning strategy gives Arya a way in which to respond to Bran's every move in a way that at the end she emerges victorious. And of course, it may not always be possible for Arya to have a winning strategy, but it turns out that for games like these, if Arya is not in a winning position, then Bran is in a winning position. So every uh, state of the game, every conceivable state of the game can be identified as being either winning or losing for one of the players. Now, if you're hearing about the concept of a winning strategy for the first time, you might find it a bit confusing or puzzling. You might wonder, how does the state of the game determine whether a player is going to win or not? Doesn't it depend on their individual skill levels? And doesn't it depend on whether they're having a good day or not? And things like that. Well, so let me just clarify a couple of things briefly. One is that in such games, we always assume that the players are playing optimally and that they have the, um, they have the skills to make the best move that is theoretically possible at any given point in the game. So this is sort of a working assumption in all of our definitions. Also, notice a few interesting characteristics of this game that we are playing here that make it different from the games that you might be used to in your day-to-day -day life, like say cricket or poker. So one thing is that this game does not have any element of chance in it. So when either player is making a move and for example saying something like reduce A by K times B, then that is going to happen. Uh, it happens in a very deterministic way. So there is no element of randomness. Unlike in say games of cricket for instance where you might plan to do something but that may not happen uh, depending on uh, the circumstances which are not completely in your control. Uh, the other thing about this game is that it's a perfect information game. So everybody knows what's going on. Unlike say games of poker where you may not know what cards your opponent has in their hand. So this makes these types of games quite special and uh, you can find out more about these games by looking specifically for combinatorial games. I will just say this for now. The fact that the kinds of games that we are discussing here, every position is either winning or losing for one of the players involved, follows by doing some kind of a backward induction argument on a object called the game tree. So the game tree is built out by essentially mapping all the possible moves that can be legitimately made by one of the players from the starting state of the game. And you just keep building this out till you reach states from where no more progress can be made. Those states are then labeled as being losing for whatever player is stuck in that state. And from here, you can work your way backwards to say that in general, if you're at a non-terminal state, then that state is winning if and only if you can make a move from here that is losing for the other player. 
So in other words, if you are at a state from where every possible move that you can make leads you to a position that is winning for the other player, then the current position is losing for you. So you can fill in the details of this argument to see that every position in the game tree can be uniquely labeled as being winning or losing for one of the two players. It's a good idea to think about where are assumptions about things like perfect information and uh, the absence of randomization are useful in making this argument work. But for now, hopefully you're convinced that this notion of a winning position is sensible. And uh, let's try to get some practice with this by looking at a few examples. So suppose you have these two numbers, 1 and 42, and it's Arya's move. Do you think this position is winning for Arya? Well, if one of the numbers is 1 and the other number is some number that is greater than 1, let's say x, then you can simply subtract x minus 1 copies of 1 from x and uh, this leads you to the configuration 1 comma 1 which is losing for the other player. So whenever one of the numbers is 1, the first player has an advantage and can in fact win the game in just one move. All right, the next example is when you have two numbers that are identical. Is this a winning position for the first player or not? Okay, so hopefully you have concluded that this is not a winning position. Notice that any move that the first player tries to make in this state is a losing move. There is no way that you can progress to a state where both of the numbers are positive. So this is not a winning position. What about if one of the numbers is a multiple of the other? And just to make sure that we are not in the previous case, let's say it's uh, the multiplier is strictly greater than one. In this case, is this a winning position or a losing position? Take a moment to think about it. Okay, so this scenario is actually winning for the first player because notice that the first player can remove r minus 1 copies of a from r a to go to the position a a. And that's a position that we saw was losing for the first player. So if the first player offers up this position to the second player, then the second player is bound to lose. So this is a winning position for the first player. Now in the next example, we have uh, a and B with the property that A lies between B and 2B strictly. So of course if A was equal to B we already know what happens and we will come back to the situation when A is at least 2B but what if A is in the range uh, strictly between B and 2B? In this case can we conclude if this position is winning for the first player or not? Okay, I should confess that this was a bit of a trick question. We don't have enough information here to conclude if this position is winning or not for the first player. In fact, you should be able to come up with examples with concrete numbers that satisfy the inequalities here and which are such that, well, you could come up with two examples, one which is winning for the first player and the other that is not winning for the first player. So there isn't enough information here, but one thing that I do want to draw your attention to is the fact that this is a forced situation for the first player. There's only one interesting move that the first player can make here. And by interesting, I just mean a move that keeps the player in the game. So apart from removing one copy of uh, B from A, so notice that A is the larger number here. So apart from removing one copy of B from A, there is no other move that is a valid move in the sense that any other move is going to um, is going to lead to the outcome that you lose the game immediately. So there's only one interesting move here. So in some sense, this is a, uh, a forced configuration. And this is a fact that we will make use of later. So just keep it at the back of your mind. Now let's go to the final example, which is probably the most interesting of the ones that we have seen so far. So what if A is at least 2B? Is there something that we can say conclusively? So I'll give you a hint here. This is not a trick question like before. You can actually conclusively say if this is a winning position or not for the first player. So really take your time and uh, pause for a minute here to think about what might happen here. 
Okay, so like before, we are in a situation where A is larger than B, but unlike before, A is now substantially larger than B. So we have uh, possibly multiple choices for valid moves that we can make. So we can certainly remove at least one copy of B from A, but possibly we can remove two, three or more. So in fact, let's divide A by B and suppose it factors as R times B plus a remainder C. So if that's what A is going to be, then what should your move be? A tempting thing to say is that maybe just remove as many copies of B as you can from A so that you're left with C comma B. But if you've played around with enough examples while you were thinking about this case, you may have realized that that may not always be the optimal move. But I promised you that this is not a trick question and we can always identify if this is winning for the first player or not. So let's think about this a little more. Let's go ahead and do the greedy thing that felt natural to us. And let's say that we remove uh, our copies of B from A. And let's say we are left with the configuration CB, which goes to the other player. Now, there could be two possible situations. Either CB is a losing position in which case, this is great because if CB is a losing position, then uh, the greedy thing was actually the right thing to do. But suppose CB is not a losing position, then it's a winning position and somehow that's a position that we want for ourselves. But remember that since A had at least two copies of B in it, uh, what we can do is we can force the other player to give us the configuration CB. And how can we do that? We can do that by subtracting R minus one copies of B instead of R copies of B. When we do that, notice that the other player is left with the configuration B plus C and B. And now this is like the situation that we had before. It's a forced situation simply because C is strictly less than B. Remember, C was the remainder that we got when we divided A by B. So C is less than B. And now the only move that is legitimate for the other player to make is removing one copy of B from the number B plus C. So when that move is played by the second player, the first player gets back the configuration CB. But this is something the first player is very happy about because we were in the case when CB was a winning configuration. So the point is that irrespective of whether CB is winning or losing you have a move that you can use to turn the game in your favor so just to summarize what we learned from the last example we saw that if a is at least two times b then the position is winning for the first player this is by no means obvious but it's going to be very useful and i hope you are convinced that this is actually the case if not then please go back and revisit the argument that we just made before moving on Alright, so let's try and summarize what we have learned so far. Remember, we are interested in understanding if AB is a winning position or not. And let's assume that A is at least B. And what we have done here is we have mapped the values of A on this number line and we have highlighted the possibilities in terms of B. So notice that we know that if A is equal to B, then it's actually a losing position. And if A is to B or more, then it's a winning position. But for values of A that lie between B plus one and two B minus one, this is a mystery. We don't really know what is going on here. Now, if we had to figure out algorithmically if AB is a winning position, then what we have right here is a fairly natural recursive approach to determining if AB is winning or not. So the algorithm will go like this. If A is at least 2B, then say yes. If A is B, then say no. And of course, the interesting case is the one that remains. What happens otherwise? If A is in the range B plus one to B minus one inclusive, then what can we do? At least algorithmically, what can we do? One hint at this point is to use some sort of a recursive idea. And can you think about which configuration should we try to identify the nature of recursively what would be a useful configuration to work with take a moment here just to recall what we have discussed so far and the answer should be evident 
Okay, so hopefully you've identified that the configuration of interest here is A minus B, B. The reason for this is that notice that when A is in the range B plus one to B minus one inclusive, then uh, the situation is forced for whichever player is playing this configuration. The only valid move that you can make at this stage is to subtract one copy of B from A. And um, the question is what happens from here? Keep in mind that the positions AB and A minus BB are being played by two different players. So just to make sure that we are on the same page, let me know what you think should happen if A minus BB turns out to be a losing position for whichever player is playing that position. What can you say about AB? Well, hopefully you've concluded that if A minus BB is a losing configuration, then AB is winning because from AB, you are able to generate a configuration that is losing for the other player, which makes you win when you start from AB. On the other hand, what if A minus BB is a winning position? What can you say in this setting? It's probably predictable, but please still think through it before committing to an answer. Okay, so if A minus B, B is a winning position, then in general, of course, it's still possible that the first player can try to divert to a different position for the second player, which is not a winning position, hopefully. But notice that in this case, we have been pushed into a corner where this move has been essentially forced on us. And uh, therefore, we can actually conclude that if A minus B, B is a winning position, then A, B is a losing position position because this is the only position that we can generate starting from a b uh, whenever a is in this range so this completes the description of the recursive algorithm what you do is you try to recursively identify if a minus b b is winning or losing and just remember to flip that outcome to report the correct situation with respect to a b now, what's the running time of this algorithm? Notice that in every step, if you are not immediately done, then you have generated an instance where the magnitude of the larger number has been reduced by half. As a result, the algorithm will terminate in logarithmically many steps, uh, a log of the larger of the two numbers that you started with in the initial configuration. So in some sense, this seems like a nice approach to figuring out if AB is winning or not. And this is a good time to tell you about the actual task that we have to perform in this problem. Notice that we are almost... Uh, 20 minutes into this lecture or even more and I still haven't told you what we are supposed to do. So this is a good time to reveal it to you. Of course, the work that we have done is going to be hugely relevant, but we will see that we still have some way to go. So here is the problem statement, the rest of it. So what we are given is four integers, a1, a2, and b1, b2, and we have to count the number of winning positions a, b for a in the range a1, a2, and b in the range b1, b2. So of course you might say that, sure, let's just try and go over all possible choices of a, b, and we have just described an algorithm to figure out if a, b is winning or not. So we can just employ that algorithm and um, you know our solution is done. And this would be a perfectly valid solution for the smaller data set, but here is the clincher for this problem at least. If you look at the limits, then it turns out that the ranges of these numbers can be as large as uh, a million, right? So now if we were to even try and explore the full range of pairs and try to do something for each of them, we are going to be in some serious trouble. In particular, the algorithm that we just described is going to be way too expensive. So we need a different approach here. So in particular, it looks like since examining every pair of numbers is going to be too expensive, we probably need a way to be able to address multiple pairs at once or to be able to draw a conclusion about a large collection of pairs somehow magically in one shot. Specifically, suppose that we fix a choice of B. So let's say we are looping over the range um, of values of B between B1 and B2. And if it were possible that we can identify somehow directly the number of A's for which AB is winning, 
right, for this fixed B. Keep in mind that B is fixed. And we just want to know how many A's are there for which AB is a winning configuration. Just remember that the crux of the matter here is to be able to do this in a way that does not involve examining each of the A's in turn. I know at this point, this intuition may seem very vague. So let's just go back to the drawing board and try to understand the problem more and see if we can make some sense of this very high level intuition that we have at this point for what our approach should be. So let's go back to the recursive approach that we were just talking about. Remember that this is the interesting range for A. This is the range that we called the mysterious range where we cannot immediately conclude if A, uh, A, B is a winning position or not. So let's just unravel the recursion and see what it's going to do. So the recursion is going to examine the position A, B, B from the perspective of the second player. Now. For the second player, we again know that A minus B, B is going to be winning if B, which now remember that B is the larger of the two numbers here, if B is substantially larger than A minus B. If that happens to be the case, then this configuration is going to be winning for the second player. And in all these cases, we can again directly conclude that A, B was losing for the first player. So let's just expand this out a bit. It turns out that what you will get is that um, A should be at most 3 by 2 B or 1.5 B for uh, this position, the original position A B to be losing for the first player. Notice that this is now strictly new information because earlier the only case that we knew of where we could directly conclude that A B is losing was when A is equal to B. But now we are saying that if A is at most 1.5 times B, then also A B is a losing position. So that's interesting. But let's try to unravel the recursion even a little bit further. So suppose even at the second layer you're stuck, you're not able to really conclude anything. This happens when again B lies strictly in the range A minus B, two times A minus B. So if B is stuck in this uh, situation, uh, remember that now B is the larger of the two numbers and uh, B is in this range, uh, we don't really know, so we need to recurse further. So how do we recurse? Well, of course, we have to remove one copy of A minus B from B, and then we need to give this back to the first player now. And uh, we need to now check out this configuration more closely. So of course, B minus A minus B is the same as 2B minus A. Um, and we know that this configuration is winning for the first player. If A minus B, which again, now remember that A minus B is the larger of the two numbers, now that one copy of A minus B has been stolen from B. So if A minus B is substantially larger than 2B minus A, then this is winning for player one. So again, you can do the arithmetic, rearrange the terms and so on. And you will see that this condition boils down to saying that A should be at least five thirds of B. Again, notice that this is fresh information. Earlier, what we knew is that if A is at least two B, then we can do a one shot uh, answer saying that this is winning. But now we can say that A is winning even if A is at least five thirds of B, which is something like 1.66 or so. And um, so now we, we have narrowed down the, uh, the range that, that we said was mysterious. So in fact, let's just try to summarize where we are in terms of the extra information that we have after unraveling two layers of recursion, okay? So this was the picture that we had previously, but now we have two new thresholds and uh, we can actually say more about uh, what positions are winning and losing. So this is an improvement. There are more cases in which we are able to directly knock out um, a conclusion for whether AB is winning or not. It seems tempting to wonder if this range of mystery can be made smaller and smaller by unraveling more and more layers of recursion. In fact, the current mystery band ranges between 1.5B and 1.66B or so. And uh, if you're curious, feel free to pause here and just uh, pick up some pen and paper and unravel a couple of layers of recursion more to see if you can shrink this mystery zone a little bit further and you can come back to tally notes with me in the rest of this video.
All right, so um, if we were to summarize what we learn by just going further and further into the recursion rabbit hole, these are the inequalities that we discover. So these inequalities are color coded by the situations that are good for the respective players. So whenever a red inequality holds, we have that that configuration is winning for the first player. And whenever a green inequality holds, then that configuration is winning for the second player. Now, just in case you're wondering where these inequalities came from, let me just remind you that we obtain these by simply unraveling more and more layers of the recursive algorithm that we discussed a few moments ago. Now, let me just rewrite these inequalities in terms of A, and uh, you will see a bunch of fractions emerging when we do this rearrangement of terms. Now, by just staring at these numbers, uh, let me ask if any patterns seem to emerge or if these numbers generally look familiar. Well, if you've seen the Fibonacci numbers before, you might recognize that these fractions are just um, ratios of consecutive Fibonacci numbers. And if you actually know about some properties of these ratios, then you can probably already make an educated guess about where this is going. But if that's um, not something that, that strikes as anything significant, let's just rewrite the fractions in terms of uh, you know their decimal counterparts. And and at least you can see that it seems like we are closing in on uh, the mystery zone. So remember that these numbers signify the ranges of values for which we already know what is happening. So in particular, the last two inequalities are the tightest and they tell us that we completely understand what's happening when A is at most uh, 1.615 times B. And we also know what's happening when A is at least 1.619 times B. So the, the values of A about which we are not sure are values that lie between uh, you know these two ratios. So um, I'm not sure if you have like a favorite mathematical constant that lies between these two numbers. Uh, but if you have heard heard of the golden ratio before, then that might just come to your mind. So you might make at this point an educated guess that perhaps it is true that these, um, you know, the, the, the mystery zone actually shrinks and shrinks and meets at the golden ratio. And it turns out that there is a reasonably formal sense in which this is actually true. So here's the statement that you can formally prove. It turns out that AB is a winning position if and only if A is at least phi times B, where phi is a mathematical constant known as the golden ratio. If you haven't heard of the golden ratio before, don't worry about it, although it's a really interesting uh, constant to learn more about, and you can look it up on uh, Wikipedia, for example, and you can find a link to that in the description of this video. For now, though, let's just contemplate if this statement statement is useful for our algorithm. So remember we said that suppose you fix a B and if you had a one shot way of figuring out how many A's in the range A1, A2 are such that AB is a winning configuration. Well, now that's simply a direct count. You just have to look at the quantity of phi times B and um, you know that all the values of A that are larger than phi times B are the ones which form winning configurations along with B. So it's just a matter of counting uh, how many numbers in this range exceed this threshold. Uh, we have been working with the assumption that A is at least B. So when you write your code, you have to account for this uh, kind of symmetry and we will see that more explicitly when we get to coding. But hopefully it's clear that this statement is extremely useful in getting to the kind of algorithm that we were hoping to find. All right, so I think with this, we have the main pieces of the puzzle in place and the main crux of the idea is hopefully beginning to become quite clear. Uh, this is probably a good point to pause the video and try out your own implementation if you feel so inclined. But uh, the rest of this video will do essentially two things. Uh, the first is to discuss why this claim is true. It's not going to be a very formal proof, but it's just going to be uh, an argument that substantiates why you might believe uh, this, this claim to be true. And you can probably expand it. Uh, you'll probably have enough details to expand it to a more formal argument if you would like to do that. And then of course, as usual, we We'll write some code and implement the solution that we have just discussed. 
Before we move on though, let me just try and address a question that might be occurring to you. It certainly did occur to me, which is the question of how do people come up with such solutions, right? I mean, especially when we were discussing this solution, the golden ratio seemed to come out of nowhere. And you might be especially concerned if you haven't heard of the golden ratio before or if you're not very familiar with the Fibonacci numbers. And uh, you might be worried that, well, these intuitions will not emerge as naturally for you. So let me say two things in response to this question. The first uh, is just in the context of this particular problem, I should point out that you don't need the full leverage of this theorem to be able to solve the uh, problem for the large tests. All you need is the intuition that there is some threshold. You don't need to really know what that threshold is. You can instead uh, binary search to find that threshold. For this, you will actually need the algorithm that we discussed in the very beginning, the algorithm for checking if a particular pair is winning or not. Remember, we had a log n type of algorithm for that, where n is the larger of the two numbers a and b. So uh, using that algorithm, what you can do is take the range a1, a2 and uh, take the middle element of this range and try to figure out if this middle element with b is winning or not. And if it turns out to be winning, then you know that the threshold is uh, lower. And if it is losing, then you know that the threshold is higher. And then you can continue your binary search. So you just need uh, to play around with enough examples to develop this intuition that there is some mystery interval which keeps shrinking and shrinking. And that there is some threshold which actually distinguishes the winning positions from the losing ones. You don't need to know what exactly that threshold is. Although if you know it, your coding will become more convenient. While binary search is a very fundamental technique, uh, it does uh, um, it does require a bit of care in the implementation. So we will be talking a lot more about binary search in the next week. But for now, this is actually a really fun exercise in binary search. So, you know, if you want to go ahead and get some practice, this would be a good time to do it. Now, the other thing that I wanted to say is not so specific to this problem, but just a more general comment, which is that if you have seen this video so far, then of course, you're already somebody who is enthusiastic about learning new things. And I would say that the more you you practice, the more you expose yourself to new ideas and new techniques, the more you build up your own toolkit of ideas that you have seen. So for example, if this happened to be your first encounter with the concept of the golden ratio, then instead of getting worried about the fact that you have not seen it before, approach it with a mindset of positivity by realizing that, well, you have seen it now, so you can add it to your notes or however it is you keep track of all the new ideas that you learn. And now this is one more thing to watch out for. It's one more idea in your toolkit. And that's how you will eventually develop your own creative flair. So in short, my suggestion would be to practice as much as you can. And instead of feeling discouraged by the things that you may not know so far, I would suggest focusing on feeling encouraged by all the exciting new things that you are learning. With all that said, I think now let's just get back to the statement here and let's um, try and figure out why something like this should be true. So uh, recall that we have the, the interesting range for A being that it's stuck between B and 2B. And in this case, we said that, well, the only move that the first player can make is to reduce A to A minus B, and you go to the configuration A minus B, B. So the formal framework that we will use to prove this uh, statement here is the framework of mathematical induction, which you might already be familiar with. So the idea is to say that assume that the statement holds for all configurations which involve smaller values of A and B. And then based on that assumption, we will show that it is true for the configuration A, B. The only missing piece here is to say that uh, the statement is true for some sort of a base case, but it turns out that for this statement, the base cases are uh, trivial, so I'll leave it to you to validate them. But for now, notice that we are, um, so, so for the interesting range of values of A, we go into a situation uh, which we are forced to be in. And in this situation, we can apply the induction hypothesis to say that this position is winning for player two if uh, B is at least phi times A minus B. So we are able to apply the statement of the theorem uh, directly here. That's the, that's the advantage of 
uh, being able to use what's called the induction hypothesis. So we know that this is the condition for this configuration to be winning for player two. And because this is an if and only if, we can turn the inequality around to say that this is the condition for this configuration to be losing for player two. You might be a bit annoyed that when I'm doing not greater than or equal to, I'm not saying strictly less than, but notice that a and B are integers and phi is uh, not an integer, so uh, the inequalities do check out, okay? So this is just a convenient way for me to be able to say this, so let's continue this uh, line of argument. Now let's just write this in terms of player one. So a configuration that is losing for player two is equivalently winning for player one. So this is the criteria that we have uh, if we want the original configuration AB to be a winning configuration for player one. One, uh, except the criteria is written in terms of uh, condition on uh, the configuration that we reach after one step. So um, what we have here is b is at most phi times a minus b and if we rearrange those terms uh, we see that we can rewrite it as um, uh, phi times a being at least 1 plus phi times b or pushing the phi to the other side we have 1 plus phi over phi times b is uh, at most a. That's, that's the inequality that you get. It turns out that it's a property of the golden ratio that uh, 1 plus phi over phi is phi again. So applying that, we arrive at exactly the statement that we wanted to prove, which is that uh, for this configuration to be winning for the first player, we need a to be at least phi times b. All right, so with that, we conclude the supporting argument for our main claim, and let's just quickly recap what the algorithm is going to do in preparation for the implementation. So remember, we have A1, A2, B1, B2 as the ranges of values of A and B. So let's just go over all the values of B from B1 through B2, and uh, for each of those values of B, we will directly try to identify the number of values of A in the range A1, A2, uh, for which AB is a winning position. And to do that, we will use this claim and uh, we'll just keep adding uh, these numbers to a running tally of the number of winning positions and that's the answer that we will return at the end. So with this we have everything we need to know to be able to start the implementation so let's just switch to coding. All right so uh, here we have the usual sort of setup you'll see that uh, the data from the sample input and the sample output in the problem description has been copied into these files for a sanity check when we need it. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, here we have the input output formats for our reference. So uh, the input is just uh, T lines and each line is these four numbers, A1, A2, B1, B2, uh, signifying the range um, for A and B respectively, right? And now we need to figure out uh, the number of winning positions A, B for A and B lying in these uh, in these corresponding ranges. So, um, so the output format is really simple. We just have to uh, essentially uh, print the case number and uh, the answer. So uh, let me just write that down as well. I'm going to pretend that we have a answer variable here, which of course we will work through and uh, that's what we're going to print. Uh, so this way I don't need this uh, for reference anymore. And let's just try to um, compute the answer based on everything that we have discussed so far. All right, before doing anything else, let me just increase the font size by a point. Uh, I think this looks better. So, uh, right, let's recall what we wanted to do. What we said is that we will look at all the values of um, B. Uh, we'll loop over all the possible values of B. So let's say that's B in range B1, B2 plus 1, right? And um, here what we said is we will try to figure out how many elements in the range A1 to A2 um, actually meet the criteria that uh, the A is um, at least phi times B, right? This was the threshold that we had. Now, if this threshold is landing somewhere within this range, A1 to A2, uh, then you can simply compute the number of A's which form a winning position along with B uh, by just subtracting uh, the threshold uh, phi B from A2 um, and then taking uh, the seal so that you're left with an actual integer, right? So you could do that. 
uh, but just keep in mind that the threshold may not actually land somewhere in the middle of this range. It's possible that, for instance, the threshold is below A1 or above A2. Of course, if the threshold is above A2, then none of these numbers satisfy uh, the criteria that we have in mind. So none of them contribute to the count of winning positions. So we don't have to worry about this. But if the threshold falls below uh, B1, then all the numbers in this range uh, contribute. So let's just make sure that we account for that um, explicitly. And notice that it is important to account for this explicitly and separately because at least uh, with the approach that I was describing, uh, if you just try to do it in one shot, you will end up over counting uh, the, the number of winning pairs. Uh, so before we actually write down uh, the conditionals, uh, let's just uh, uh, do some preparation. I think we will want to have a variable that represents P, the golden ratio. Now you might be tempted to write down like the actual constant uh, up to a few decimal places, uh, but I found that that can be dangerous because you're working with really large numbers here you may not get the precision that you want by just listing out a few digits in the in the decimal version of the constant we also may have to do some floor ceiling sort of thing so let's just make sure that the math library is imported and uh, now we can go back to trying to um, do the cases that we had in mind so the first thing we said is that if a1 is greater than this threshold so um, then uh, the entire range of numbers from A1 to A2 actually contributes to the number of winning pairs. So we need to make sure that our answer is incremented by A2 minus A1 plus 1. That's the number of numbers that are there um, sort of in this range. I think I have a typo with the variable name for B here, so let's fix that. All right, so now let's look at the else part, okay? So uh, here we want to count the number of numbers in the range A1 to A2, uh, which actually exceed the threshold golden times B, right? So a natural way to do that probably is to say A2 minus um, golden times B. You can probably already guess that this is going to be problematic because this expression is not even an integer and we really want to be counting the number of pairs. So this is not the right thing to do. Uh, so it seems like the appropriate thing to do is to uh, take a floor or a ceiling on uh, this number, this, this threshold. And uh, I have to confess that um, I'm very slow with uh, getting these kinds of things right. And this is really where a lot of edge cases and corner cases happen. So when I'm in this situation, I'll probably do something uh, really silly, like take an example and ask myself, suppose the range A1 to A2 was uh, the numbers from 1 to 10, and uh, suppose the threshold was uh, 7.5. It doesn't have to be a realistic threshold, it's just some, uh, let's say, some fractional number. And so what do we want now? We want to eliminate everything that is less than 7.5 and we want to keep everything that is greater than 7.5. So uh, what should we subtract from 10? What's the correct thing to subtract from 10 for this to happen? Well, it happens to be uh, 7. 7 is what you should, like 7 of these numbers, um, you know, should uh, should go away. So, uh, so it makes sense to take floor. That's probably a horribly non um, sort of formal way of saying it, but uh, for these edge cases, I usually find that just doing some quick and dirty examples is uh, probably the quickest way of making sure that you got it right. And if it's a more tricky corner case situation, you might want to actually uh, really run through some examples, like run your code through some test cases and so on before moving forward. But this seems reasonable here. So uh, we go ahead and do this. Notice that this may still be a little bit problematic because, uh, for example, um, what happens if your threshold is above uh, A2? So we said that um, in this case, none of these numbers contribute to the number of winning pairs, but this uh, expression does not reflect that. Uh, what you're going to get if say the threshold is 12 and uh, you know the number the number of numbers the range you're looking at is 1 to 10 uh, then this expression will give you something like 10 minus 12 which is a negative number and uh, that'll offset your count in a way that's not good so you just want to basically stop at zero so when the numbers are negative you want to basically make sure that they get counted as zero so the simplest way to do that is to take a max with zero so that should work 
Now, this seems like everything that we did discuss so far, uh, but it turns out that if you try to submit this code, you'll probably end up getting a wrong answer, which can be a little bit frustrating because it seems like exactly what we have discussed. Okay, so if you remember during our discussion, I made some passing comment about how when we are actually coding, we should account for symmetries. So notice that in our entire discussion, we have been saying just assume that A is at least B and uh, that's without loss of generality. But here we are really looking at ordered pairs and um, there's no reason to believe that A is at least B for the numbers that we are looking at right now. So uh, to put this more generally, I would say that the thresholding condition is that the larger of the two numbers or let me write down max of a b should be at least uh, phi times min of a b now when it comes to b being the larger of the two numbers this of course translates to b being at least phi times a um, and if you want to understand the criteria in terms of a then that's going to be a is uh, at most uh, 1 over phi uh, times b now it turns out that 1 over phi is uh, just uh, phi minus 1, so that's just a slightly more convenient way of writing this threshold. So now let's go to our cases and uh, clean them up in the light of this new information. So, uh, so the other situation where uh, you could have numbers contributing to winning pairs if A is at most phi minus 1 times B, right? So now this is a threshold which, let's say, um, let's say this threshold uh, phi minus one times b was greater than a2, right? What does that mean? That means that all the numbers from a1 to a2 actually meet this threshold's criteria, right? And therefore they should all contribute to the sum. So we need to enhance our first conditional to account for this situation. So we want to say that if um, phi minus one times b, um, is um, greater than a2, right? If phi minus 1 times b, this threshold is greater than a2, that means all the numbers in the range a1 through a2 uh, meet, the, meet the criteria that, that we have uh, written above, right? And therefore, they should all contribute to the sum. Okay, so that's uh, that's a fairly straightforward modification there. And now let's clean up the else branch as well. So previously, uh, we had a lower threshold. So we were counting everything that uh, essentially went from that threshold till the end of the range. Now we have an upper threshold. So we have to count all the numbers that uh, essentially fall below the threshold um, phi minus one times b. So we need to increment our answer accordingly. So essentially we have, once again, we want everything to be below this threshold. So let's again uh, say floor for now. And um, if this is not clear, I'll just come back and justify it in a minute. But uh, let me just write out the threshold to begin with. So this is what we have. Okay, um, so that's the threshold and we need to take away um, minus A1 actually, then we have taken away one more than we need to. So let's compensate for that by adding one. Now notice that you might run into the same issue as before with these numbers being negative. In this case, this can happen when the upper threshold is below A1. Uh, if that happens, then this expression will evaluate to a negative number and will completely throw off your count. So um, it's a simple but important fix uh, to again make sure that you take the max with zero. Uh, these are the kind of like small edge cases uh, which can seem very mysterious when your code is returning some sort of a wrong answer status. Uh, but hopefully again, uh, the more practice you have thinking through uh, this sort of thing, the more alert you will be to, um, to the edge cases. So let's just uh, go through the ritual of running uh, this code and checking the output. And it does seem like the, the output matched here. Now, of course, this is a good time to remind ourselves that this doesn't mean very much. Uh, in most cases, the sample tests are uh, not enough to account for all the edge cases. Sometimes they're even deliberately misleading, uh, depending on uh, you know the problem author and things like that. 
Uh, so definitely uh, make sure to try and test a little more expansively, especially given that this is a problem involving large numbers. Uh, it's easy to generate some random tests or even just throw in four numbers that match the thresholds of the problem and see how long your code is going to take on this. Just to make sure, for example, that your code will not time out when you submit it. Uh, in fact, since this is a fairly easy thing to do, let's just try it right now. So let's say that we set our thresholds to be one and uh, a million. Uh, let's say those are uh, the ranges uh, that we have in mind. And uh, let's run this code again. Uh, one of the most common issues uh, that, that comes up when we are discussing, uh, say, choices of programming languages is this issue of Python being slow. Uh, but notice here that uh, this code uh, runs in well under a second, and uh, we've really pushed uh, the input to its limit. So that's kind of uh, what a good algorithm uh, can do for you. That's the leverage uh, that it can buy. Uh, by the way, this reminds me that just in case uh, you are uh, literally using the same startup file uh, before you submit on CodeJam just make sure to uh, remove all of these operating system specific things uh, because otherwise you will end up getting a runtime error so just submit the part of the code that's relevant to the problem and uh, yeah that's uh, that's essentially about it I mean I think uh, we have discussed uh, this problem quite thoroughly hopefully all aspects are clear in case any of the floors or ceilings are throwing you off again just be sure to work with small examples I think there is no shame in just doing some quick and dirty examples, no matter how simple, if they help you sanity check uh, the corner cases of your code. So uh, thanks for watching all the way. And uh, you know, if you're stuck with anything, as usual, do join us on Discord. And I look forward to seeing you there as well as in the next lecture. Bye for now.